Thank you. Um, I feel very privileged to get to be here today to talk to all of you about my research. Um, I am a cognitive psychologist at Wolford Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. And today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about some research that I've been doing exploring sensory processing subtypes. So before we get started, I would like to take the time to acknowledge the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapowak, and the Shawnatan nations, whose traditional territories are where most of this research presentation was prepared and much of this research was conducted. So as we go about our everyday lives, whether we're riding in a school bus, we're commuting to work in our car, we're interacting with peers in the classroom, or we're shopping for groceries. Across all of these different environments, we're constantly bombarded with sensory information. We can't escape the sights, the sounds, the smells that are sort of all encompassing and all around us. And given we function in such sensory rich environments, differences in sensory processing have the potential to have dramatic effects on our ability to function within these environments. So with that in mind, my colleagues and I have been working to better understand how differences in sensory processing are related to differences in other behaviors. So for today's talk, I'm gonna focus on how differences in sensory processing are related to differences in attention, social behaviors, as well as anxiety. Today's talk is mostly gonna focus on how these differences in sensory processing might be related to differences in attention, social behaviors, and anxiety. So much of my research to date has focused on understanding sensory differences in autism. Uh, one thing I do like to note is I'm going to be using identity first language throughout the presentation. So I'll be talking about autistic people, given that is generally the expressed preference of these individuals. Um, as I'm sure just about everyone in this room is aware of, uh, autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disability that is characterized by differences in social communication and interaction, as well as restricted and repetitive patterns of behaviors and interests. So while autism is regarded as a social disability by many, What's less commonly known is autistic individuals demonstrate both hyper and hyposensitivities to sensory information. In other words, autistic people are often more or less reactive to sensory information in their environment. Estimates suggest that upwards of 95% of the autistic population demonstrate sensory processing differences, with auditory differences most commonly reported. So some of my colleagues here and I uh, recently surveyed parents of autistic children with auditory sensitivities, and over 70% of the sample indicated that their child's sound sensitivities influenced their participation at home, at school, and in the community. So these sensory differences not only create distress in the individual, but they also impact everyday functioning for the individual. So given that these sensory processing differences appear to interfere with everyday life, I'm very interested in better understanding how differences in sensory processing have downstream effects on things like attention, social behaviors, and anxiety. Importantly, given autistic people show both differences in sensory processing as well as differences in attention, social behaviors, and anxiety, uh, better understanding these sensory behavior interactions can potentially lead to improved quality of life. And more from a research perspective, understanding these interactions can also help us to better understand sensory processing, attention, social behaviors, and anxiety more broadly. One common misconception uh, when we're talking about sensory sensitivities in autistic people is that autistic individuals are either oversensitive or undersensitive to sensory information. Instead, what recent research suggests is that both within and across autistic people, there's a high degree of variability 
in their sensory preferences. Uh, so for example, using hypothetical characters, Jane and John, Jane may be overly sensitive to noise, but they're fascinated by bright lights. On the other hand, John loves making noise, but he wears sunglasses inside because even normal indoor lighting can be distressing for him. That being said, to really understand these sensory behavior interactions, um, it would be helpful to first better understand this variability in sensory processing within the autistic population. So kind of getting to the methods that we use to do this, um, one method that could be used to better understand variability is what's called a cluster analysis. So a cluster analysis is a data analysis technique that can be used to identify subtypes within a larger population. So basically what this technique does is it allows us to find individuals that are very similar to one another, but distinct from other individuals in the group. Um, so applying these cluster analyses to sensory information can allow us to understand how traits or behaviors co-occur together, and that then allows us to identify different subtypes. So as depicted in this hypothetical example here, um, if we have, sorry, if we have a very large set of data, I don't think it's showing on my screen, I'll use this one. So if we have a very large data set like you see here, what we can do is cluster it into separate subgroups where the individuals in each of these groups are very similar, but distinct from individuals in the other groups. So here we're taking a large data set and clustering it into three. Uh, very importantly, it, using this clustering technique, when we create these subgroups, we can better understand the characteristics of the individuals in each of these subgroups relative to when they were part of this much larger group. So applying this to sensory processing data in autism, we can take the sensory behaviors of a very large group of autistic people and look for patterns or subgroups within that data. So today I'm gonna to talk about a cluster analysis that we performed on short sensory profile data that we collected from 599 autistic youth. Uh, the participants in our sample were between the ages of one and 21 years with an average age of about 10 years. Importantly, the short sensory profile is a very well validated parent report measure of sensory processing and it considers the seven different domain, domains you see here on the screen. Um, but I'm also gonna talk about these in a little bit more detail next, so I'll just kind of skip over that for now. So over the next few slides, I'm gonna walk you through some of the questions that appear on this short sensory profile, just to kind of give you a better idea of how we assess sensory processing. Uh, but one thing I want you to keep in mind is how parents respond to these questions. So after they read each of the questions, they score each question um, based on whether their child always, frequency, frequency, frequently, um, occasionally, seldom, or never expresses this behavior or shows this behavior. So starting with tactile or touch processing, and an, exa an example of some of the questions included are things like avoids going barefoot, especially in sand or grass, reacts emotionally or aggressively to touch, rubs or scratches out a spot that's been touched. Considering taste and smell, some of the questions included are avoid certain tastes or food smells that are typically part of a, children or a child's diet, will only eat certain tastes, is a picky eater, especially regarding food textures, For movement, parents were asked questions like becomes anxious or dis distressed when feet leave the ground, fears falling or heights, and dislikes activities where head is upside down. For the under-responsive and sensory seeking domain, the questions included things like enjoys strange noises or seeks to make noise for noise's sake, touches people and objects, and becomes overly excitable during movement activity. 
for auditory filtering. Questions were like, is distracted or has trouble functioning if there's a lot of noise around? Doesn't respond when name is called, but you know their hearing is okay? And has difficulty paying attention? For low energy and weak, questions were like, seems to have weak muscles, tires easily, especially when standing or holding a particular body position, and props to support self even during activity. Then our very last domain is the visual and auditory sensitivity domain, and questions include things like holds hands over ears to protect from sounds, is bothered by bright lights after others have adapted to light, and responds negatively to unexpected or loud sounds. So once parents have answered all 38 questions, again, those were just a subset of those questions, um, a score of one is assigned to answers of always and all the way to five for responses of never. What that means is higher scores are indicative of less sensory processing differences, where lower scores are indicative of more sensory processing differences. Importantly for the data that I'm about to describe, um, we normalized all these scores before we completed the analysis. And what this means is that the scores I'm about to show you are all relative to the average score of our sample of 599 autistic participants. So a score of zero means that the individual was the average of that group of 599 autistic individuals, whereas a positive score means fewer sensory processing differences than autistic peers, and a negative score means more sensory processing differences relative to autistic peers. So for the main event, um, so we obviously wanted to see whether these subtypes did in fact exist. And so we started by looking at a model with two different subtypes. So what this ended up showing us is two groups. One is 321 autistic individuals who all had above average sensory processing abilities relative to their group. We then had 278 individuals who all had below average sensory processing abilities relative to their group. We then considered three subtypes. Uh, this replicated our first solution, so we ended up with this above average and below average group, but we, ended up, we also had a third intermediate group. When we looked at a four subtype solution, again, we ended up with this above average and below average group, but then we had two additional groups uh, that were differentiated by below average um, taste and smell and above average taste and smell processing. When we modeled a fifth subtype, again, we retained those four different subtypes, but we then got an additional group uh, with marked impairments in movement, as well as low energy with weakness. After we modeled this fifth subtype, we continued by looking at a six, seven, and eight subtype model. Um, but what happened is when we added these additional groups, we weren't able to explain new variants. What that means is the new groups were just replicates of these existing groups. Based on that, we stopped at five subtypes and said these five subtypes are allowing us to explain unique patterns of sensory behaviors in autism. So looking a little bit more closely at these five subtypes, we had children who were sensory adaptive so these children had fewer sensory processing differences relative to their peers. We had children defined as generalized sensory differences, so they all had below average sensory processing relative to their peers. We had a taste and smell sensitive group, so they were below average in taste and smell, but above average in low energy with weakness. We had an under-responsive and sensory seeking group, who were below average for sensory seeking, but above average for taste and smell, movement, and low energy with weakness. And then lastly, we had a movement with low energy and weakness group that were below average for movement and low energy with weakness. Importantly, and what I really wanna drive home is what this research demonstrates 
is that we go beyond this simple hyper versus hyposensitivity distinction. Instead, we have these unique patterns of sensory processing that really allow us to describe unique behaviors uh, in autistic individuals. One thing that's very important about this research as well, though, or the way that I'm depicting this research, is you have to remember that this is a sample of autistic participants. So if we were to take the average scores of all of the participants in this sample and compare them to a non-autistic sample, all of the individuals on average are still scoring below non-autistic people in terms of sensory processing abilities. So even someone in the sensory adaptive group still has sensory differences relative to a non-autistic population, but they're scoring above average relative to their autistic peers. So now that we've established these sensory subtypes exist, the next step was to examine their ability to explain other behaviors. So for the sake of today's talk and the theme of this, uh, these two days, I'm going to focus on attention, social behaviors, and anxiety. So starting with attention, we used the SWAN scale, which is the Strengths and Weaknesses of Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder Symptoms of Normal Behavior Scale, that's a mouthful, um, to examine attentional behaviors. So it is an 18 item parent report scale and it considers two domains once it's scored. So an inattention and a hyperactivity subscale. And for this, we had data from 463 autistic young adults um, who we also had sensory data from. So this allowed us to compare sensory and anxiety. So looking at the inattention and hyperactivity subscales, so what you see along the bottom here are those five different sensory, or sensory subtypes I just talked about. So the sensory adaptive, generalized sensory difference, taste and smell, under responsive and sensory seeking, and movement with low energy and weakness. And looking across these uh, two different domains, we see that youth that were described as sensory adaptive, so this, pheno or this subtype was associated with less inattention and hyperactivity uh, relative to the other four phenotypes. Also, we found that the taste and smell sensitivity subtype was associated with less inattention relative to the generalized sensory difference subtype. So the results of that first analysis provide evidence that sensory processing behaviors are related to differences in attention. Next, we looked at whether the relationship between sensory processing um, and social behaviors exists. So for this one, uh, to assess the relationship between sensory and social, we looked at scores on the social communication questionnaire, as well as the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale second edition, specifically focusing on the communication and the socialization subscales. Both of these, again, are parent report questionnaires. And for both of them, we had 534 completed questionnaires that could also be paired with sensory questionnaires. So starting with the SCQ, um, we found that the sensory adaptive subtype was associated with less social differences. So again, with the SCQ, higher scores are indicative of more autistic traits. So in this case, the children described as sensory adaptive were reported to have less social differences. Looking at the communication and socialization subscales of the Violence Adaptive Behavior Questionnaire, a similar pattern was noticed where the sensory adaptive subtype was associated with more adaptive communication and socialization skills. So again, we can check our box and show that there's a meaningful relationship between sensory processing and social behaviors. Finally, we examined whether a relationship exists between sensory processing and anxiety. So these anxiety behaviors were examined three different ways. We had clinical diagnoses of co-occurring anxiety disorders along with autism. 
We had data from the Spence Children's Anxiety Scale. This allowed us to look more specifically at different anxiety domains, like panic, separation anxiety, social, social anxiety, and generalized anxiety. And we also had the revised Children's Anxiety and Depression Scale, which had similar domains. Um, importantly here, we had a smaller set of data across our two different questionnaires. So we had 315 uh, parents of youth complete the RCAD and only 164 parents complete the SCAS. So starting with our clinical reports, 21% of the children classified as having uh, generalized sensory differences were also diagnosed with a co-occurring anxiety disorder. 17% of the children classified as having sensory behaviors associated with movement difficulties and low energy uh, were also diagnosed with a co-occurring anxiety disorder. These rates were much higher than we see for children in the sensory adaptive, taste and smell, and under-responsive and sensory seeking domains. Looking more specifically at anxiety behaviors across these um, panic, separation, social, and generalized anxiety uh, subscales, starting with the Spence Children Anxiety Scale, we see that children that were classified by generalized sensory differences had higher levels of anxiety overall. Looking at the revised children's anxiety and depression scale, we see a similar pattern where children classified with the generalized sensory difference um, subtype had elevated levels of anxiety. But we also find that children classified with the movement and low energy and weakness subtype had higher rates of both generalized anxiety as well as panic uh, behaviors. Notably, you'll remember this does line up with our clinical diagnoses as well, where, where we're seeing elevated levels of anxiety corresponding to generalized sensory differences as well as movement with low energy and weakness. So together, these relationships provide strong evidence um, for this interconnection or these brain behavior relationships uh, that relate sensory processing to attention, social behaviors, and anxiety. And what I really want to drive home is, for me, especially as a sensory researcher, but in general, it's important to remember that sensory input is the primary input to our brain. So as we're navigating our environments, we're taking all of the information in through our senses. So if this route from our environment to our brain is different across different individuals, it's very natural to assume that there are going to be behavioral differences because these individuals are experiencing the world very differently because that pathway is altered. Um, so again, really, it makes me happy that I can get to this point and say, duh, of course there's a relationship between sensory behaviors and all of these other behaviors. It, it completely makes sense. Um, but if we look more specifically across these different uh, subtypes that I've described, um, you can see that when we talk about individuals who are sensory adaptive, we see more adaptive attention, social, and anxiety behaviors. When we look at people described as having generalized sensory differences, we see the greatest difference in terms of attention, social, and anxiety. Those with taste and smell sensitivities as their primary concern, we see or more differences in the social domain with more adaptive attention and anxiety processes. For under-responsive and sensory seeking, again, we see more adaptive anxiety functioning, but lower functioning in attention and social domains. And then lastly, with movement and low energy and weakness, we see moderate differences across attention, social and anxiety. So knowing that these brain behavior interactions exist, we can now try to find ways to leverage this knowledge. Acknowledging the fact that these relationships are likely bi-directional. This is something that's been talked about already today, but it's not necessarily sensory differences driving attention, social, and anxiety differences. They feed back and forth with each other. But knowing that these relationships exist, we can help to support sensory behaviors and attentional behaviors, social behaviors, and anxiety behaviors, knowing that intervening with one 
is going to have a, an effect on the other. Uh, so for me, I think what's really important is we can use this information to try to promote and improve the quality of life for autistic people. We know that we function in this very rich sensory world. So by accommodating people's sensory needs, whether it's increasing or decreasing the amount of sensory information available to them, um, we can not only improve those feelings of distress that the individuals might be experiencing, but we can also potentially improve attention, social behaviors, and anxiety behaviors. Also, I think even more importantly, is this understanding that everyone's sensory behaviors are not the same. So accommodating one person might actually make things worse for another person. And we need to consider these diverse set, sets of sensory needs. Um, also, by understanding these relationships, autistic people, as well as their caregivers, can be better prepared to cope with distressing environments. Knowing that a high sensory environment for someone who's in the generalized sensory different subtype is also going to promote feelings of anxiety, it's going to promote social withdrawal, and it's going to lead to difficulties with attention. So again, understanding these bi-directional relationships can really help us to be better prepared to manage all of these behaviors and really just develop tools to support individuals across diverse sensory environments. So in conclusion, this research demonstrates that sensory differences can be explained using these five unique sensory subtypes. Uh, these subtypes allow us to better describe differences in sensory processing and autism, but they also help us to better understand differences in other behaviors like attention, anxiety, and social behaviors. Ultimately, I believe this research suggests that supporting autistic people's sensory differences might be a key step in promoting more adaptive attentional processes, improved social behaviors, and managing anxiety. So before I wrap up, I'd like to thank the Province of Ontario Neurodevelopmental Disorders Network, which is where a lot of this data came from, as well as all of my collaborators and all of you. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Just a, a question about your choice to use the mean of the whole group as your sort of um, baseline. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, I think that that choice is based on the fact, uh, with the alternative being normalizing these scores to non-autistic um, groups, is that what you're asking? That's driven largely by the fact that if we were to do this and not do it within the autistic sample, the difference between the autistic and non-autistic sample is so large that it would um, obscure our ability to detect those patterns. So what we did as the first step in this data analysis is compare autistic and non-autistic people on these different domains, and there were significant differences across every domain. So uh, non-autistic people and autistic people perform very, very differently on these. Mm -hmm. What we find if we run a similar analysis on non-autistic people is that similar subtypes appear, but the problem is the majority of the non-autistic people fall into the sensory adaptive group. So if we then combine autistic people and non-autistic people in the same analysis, it just it makes it more difficult for us to detect the differences across these different groups. Other questions? Go for it. Um, how would you suggest presenting results of sensory profile to people with autism? Um, I think this kind of relates to a question that I got over our, our lunch break, even talking about the measure that we used in general to, to look at these sensory behaviors. 
I don't even necessarily think at this point in the research these specific five subtypes are the big important takeaway from this presentation. I think the mere existence of sensory subtypes is the very important takeaway. The fact that we see not just oversensitivity and undersensitivity, but we have these more nuanced subtypes that involve unique differences in sensory processing and the fact that those unique differences are then predictive of other behaviors. So full disclosure, we are not the only research lab that is taking this approach to looking at sensory behaviors. And there tends to be some variability across different labs when they look at these subtypes. There is a high degree of consistency. There's usually always a sensory adaptive. There's always a generalized sensory difference. And there's usually a taste and smell group. But the under responsive and the movement groups appear for some researchers and not for others, which what that suggests to me is there's more work that needs to be done to really understand these different sensory profiles. Um, and again, a lot of that may depend on the type of sensory questions we're asking. So using 38 questions and asking parents about them isn't going to give us the whole picture of sensory behaviors. As was talked about earlier, it, this questionnaire ignores interoception. So it's a whole domain of sensory processing that's not being included in this. But again, what I hope to leave all of you with today is we need to understand sensory behaviors at a finer level than just saying people are over or under responsive because it's really those, those finer differences that really help to explain other behaviors. This isn't much of a question, but more of a comment is like, I'm just so glad that there's research being done on this. And I was fascinated by your presentation because I've had to kind of like sift through myself of am I hyposensitive or hypersensitive to things because I have such sound and light sensitivity, but I eat raw garlic as a snack. Like it's just those kind of things that have always been so confusing to me because I'm told it's like one or the other. So to know that there's, you know, people seeing that there's subtypes and more to just a sensory profile than your one or the other is just, it's really wonderful. So thank you for this. Yeah. Thank you. I have two questions, actually. <laughs> um, the first one is uh, clinical. Uh, I think this is so promising. You can't really get these from the scale itself. And I think most people aren't going to be doing a cluster analysis in general practice. So I'm wondering what your plans are for actually making a process like this more available clinically, um, or if you're thinking about a new measure, just because in order for somebody to actually identify this person is sensory sensitive or et cetera, you know, or in the weak and low motor, um, that we would need kind of a new measure, at least a new measurement approach clinically to do that. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. And then I have a different question. You just question. need to read my papers. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think the first step is alluding to what I said before. We just need to find more stability. We need to keep doing this using different sensory measures. The short sensory profile isn't the only measure out there. So if we can keep looking at how these subtypes emerge across different sensory questionnaires, different sensory assessments, even some that are more uh, like psychophysical, like actually collecting physiological data and seeing how that maps onto these phenotypes, I think we just need to learn a lot more about them before we could be confident about which ones exist. And then at that point, we'll be looking to translate it more into the clinical lens. Um, admittedly, I am a cognitive neuroscientist. I am not a clinician. Mm -hmm. So my end goal in a lot of ways with this research is to better understand how the brain works so that I can give you guys that information to do your great work. Um, but even from my standpoint, I'm hoping to use it to better understand other data that I collect in my lab. So my other primary area of work is speech motor control and understanding how the motor system uses sensory information to allow us to speak. A big problem with our research is we see a lot of variability across the different participants that we bring in. But knowing it's a sensory task, if I can parse some of that variability now by looking at these different subtypes within my sample, 
I might be able to better explain variance in those behaviors. <coughs> so I think clinically it certainly has a lot of relevance, but I think it also has a ton of relevance to the research field as well by helping us to better understand the data that we collect <coughs> in the lab, which will then further inform clinical practice. So yeah, like 100%. I'm just a little worried at this point. Researchers will be able to identify a subtype and associate it with outcomes, but on the f like the, the in the real world end, yeah. people are going to have to just kind of put the pieces together, yeah. like we had just heard described. Like, oh, I think probably I'm in this subtype, as opposed to actually being able to see that from a measure. You know, yeah. from your clinical standpoint, I would love to hear suggestions <laughs> about that because again, that's not a world I live in. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where w it's a theme that's come out a lot today too. This is where we need to be talking and we need to be finding ways to bridge application with kind of this more basic science. I have a second question, but I, if somebody else wants to go. Okay, uh, second question, uh, and I'm sorry if I missed this. It w was it all parent report? Yes. Okay, so my second question is, what do you see when you actually use multi-informants, and is there convergence about what people's sensory uh, profile is when you're getting different opinions, not just one person's opinion about what the person might be struggling with or more adaptive? With some of the, not in my lab, but with some of the other um, research in this field, there has been self-report measures used. And again, we see some level of convergence, but that's still another area that needs to be explored. And we need to, we need to look at what that will show. Like I said too, I think it's very important to get away from the self-reporting or parent reporting in general and look at more objective measures of sensory processing and sensory reactivity and thresholds to different types of stimuli and see how that maps onto these different profiles as well. Thank you. Let's do this one and then we'll go to you, okay? Um, this question is from one of our folks who is watching online. My autistic daughter is sensory seeking retouch, is sensitive to loud sharp noises and her ears ring in loud environments. She likes onions and garlic, <laughs> has difficulty <laughs> with attention, feels ill on a daily basis due to anxiety, and has low energy. She is 13. Where does she fit in this research? She is also sensitive to fluorescent lighting. That was a lot of information that came <laughs> at me very quickly. So I think my best way to answer that question would be via email. <laughs> um, my email's there. I'd be very happy to, to talk more about it, but I don't think I can do that computation okay. that quick in my head. <laughs> someone, someone wanted to know where you're publishing your results. This is actually already published. So if it's not a full citation, but this is the, the brief citation. So it's in molecular autism. Again, if, if you're interested in seeing the full paper, you can send me an email and I'd be happy to send it as well. It's open access too. Yes. Sure. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I guess it's not so much a question, but just a comment. Uh, at one of the morning sessions, Grace asked about uh, uh, virtual reality. And I shared with her a paper where the researchers were using a virtual reality headset to simulate real world experiences, mm -hmm. and then measuring using tools like eye tracking, uh, brainwave tracking, heart rate, breathing rate, motion tracking, um, to provide objective data. I just thought it'd be really interesting to add a data set like this to, to cluster analysis. Funny enough, right now I am collecting data using virtual reality. Ah. Um, and so for the study that we're looking mm -hmm. at, we're measuring gait, so we're measuring walking patterns. Okay. And with virtual reality, we're simulating different sensory environments, so either a sparse or a very busy city-like environment. Right. And we're looking at visual conditions, auditory conditions, auditory and visual conditions, and comparing how different levels of sensory information affect walking patterns. Our yeah. preliminary results right now show that the multi-sensory environment, so where there's a lot of visual and auditory, it leads to um, reduced performance across the various different gate parameters relative to unisensory or baseline conditions. Um, so it's showing that altering the sensory environment alters motor output. The hope is if we get enough data collected, 
we're going to uh, subtype our, our group and see if we can further explain differences in performance across those subtypes. So that that is sort of what I said, where I hope that we can use this in a research stance to help better understand the data we collect, because I think that that's where this needs to go. We need to leverage it to, to understand why when we collect data in the lab, it's different across individuals. It, it's insane to think that we'd bring in 20 autistic people and they would all to perform the same knowing the amount of variability we see in autism. So yeah. I'm trying to better explain that variability so I can better understand our research output. Okay, look forward to seeing that research. Thank you. Last one. Um, I'm familiar with another uh, way of creating subcategories. Um, the STAR Institute has promoted um, explain three different subcategories. One is differences in sensory modulation, differences in discrimination, and differences in movement. Um, I'm curious if you've compared your findings to their findings, if, yeah. Just I'm not actually familiar with that one in particular. <coughs> like I said, there is um, a bunch of different groups that are working on similar types of modeling. And right now, that's what we need to do more of, is try to see how our findings converge and what makes them different when they don't. Um, and that's why I said I don't think this is quite ready to go to a clinical uh, level yet, because we still have to understand why we think this best explains it and they think it's best explained by those three domains. So I'm thinking likely there's aspects of both models that make sense. We just need to figure out how to kind of make them complement one another. So, yeah. thank you.